First of all, I'd like to welcome everybody. It's a great pleasure to see so many people here, many people that I know and also many people that I don't, and it's a, a tribute, I guess, to the embracing nature of sound studies that we're going to be meeting a lot of new faces uh, in the course of the next few days. My name is Sarah Kay, and I'm a professor in the Department of French Literature, Thought and Culture, and I'm also director of the Center uh, for French Civilization and Culture here at NYU. The proliferation of F words uh, at uh, NYU can cause confusion, so I will just briefly explain that the, the Center for French Civilization and Culture draws on the combined academic strengths in French and Francophone studies of the university, primarily those of the Department of French Literature, Thought and Culture, and of the Institute of French Studies to promote the intellectual and cultural life of the French-speaking world. While the center's home is here on the square and our primary, uh, if, uh, the primary event space that we have is this wonderful uh, Maison Française directed by Francine, uh, we also enjoy exchanges and interconnected programs with colleagues based elsewhere, notably at NYU Paris. The Center for French Civilization and Culture is recognized as a centre d'excellence by the French Embassy and benefits from funding from its cultural services. And it's they that have, to a large extent, supported the events of the next couple of days. In fact, I was hoping that Madame la Conseillère Culturelle would be here, but uh, she may have uh, had a change of plan. The subject of our conference, the general outline of the program, and eventually its detailed realization, grew out of many conversations, first with François Nudelman, my co-organizer, professor of philosophy and literature at Paris 8. François and I share an interest in sound studies, a relatively new academic field dedicated to studying and reflecting on sound. Sound studies is unusually interdisciplinary, even by modern standards, since it includes the arts, humanities, social sciences, theoretical and practical sciences. Our speakers and guests include literary scholars, historians, musicologists, philosophers, artists, as well as closet meloman poets and musicians of all kinds. Our title, The Sense of Sound, engages with one of the main issues in sound studies, which is about the value to accord to sound as a sensory phenomenon sense in terms of the senses, as against sound as a means of access to meaning, sense as a synonym of significance. The same equivocation is present in the French version of the title Le Sens du Son. In fact, it characterizes the French language more than it does the English one, since the French verb entendre means both to hear and to understand, whereas in English this double meaning is not found in the verb hear, but only in the verb to see, as it, is, as it also is in French. A conversation that I had with the cultural councillor Benedict de Montlore was especially productive in preparing this event. She shared with me that one of the themes the embassy is especially highlighting this year is la créativité française. It's thanks to her and the cultural services that this conference is partly academic inquiry and part festival since it's built around live performances by three French sound artists. First, we have composer and theater director Roland Ozé, with his innovative, immersive staging of In the Solitude of the Cotton Fields by French playwright Bertrand Marie Coltes. Next, thanks to Francois, we were able to coordinate with the visit to New York of Paris's IRCAM, their Institut de Recherche et Coordination Acoustique Musique who are here to perform Boulez's réponse at the Armory. IRCAM's director, Franck Madlener, will be speaking to us on Saturday morning. And third, and again thanks to Francois, uh, we have been able to convince the, the composer Mikhail Levinas to come also. His recent passion, Passion selon Marc, une passion après Auschwitz, was the subject of a, rap a rapturous and extensive review in Le Monde recently and Mikhail Levinas will share his views on musical sound as well as some of his music itself with us in a concert uh, and presentations on Saturday afternoon. The 
program was strengthened by many other conversations and friendships. As I said, it's through François Nudelman that we were able to invite Franck Madeleineur and Mikhail Levinas. I am fortunate to count among my friends the virtuoso pianist Marilyn Nonken, a specialist in French music, who will be performing two works by Levinas at Saturday's concert. One of these, a piece called Anaglyph, will in fact be a world premiere, because as uh, Mikhail explained to me this morning, this piece was written for a piano competition, but was in fact uh, never professionally performed. Thanks to Marilyn, the Messian segment of the concert, his Harawi, a work that will all be also be talked about by one of our panelists, will be performed by two French artists, Irena Kateva Emar and Rula Safar, who are friends of hers. Thanks to uh, Marilyn, too, Steinhardt has graciously sponsored us by providing accommodation for the last day of the conference. It was my friend and colleague Judy Miller who first suggested inviting Roland Audet. Through conversations initiated by her, we were so fortunate as to gain support and assistance from Skirball. The performances of In the Solitude of the Cotton Fields tonight and on Sunday wouldn't be possible without this collaboration, together with, and above all thanks to, the energy and commitment of Nicole Blum of the French Cultural Services, who, with kind of manic, actually, force of will, su succeeded in securing the necessary funding from uh, FACE, or FAS, La Muse en Circuit, Act Opus, and the Cultural Services themselves. These performances will also, by the way, be a world premiere, that of Judy Miller's new translation of In the Solitude of the Cotton Field. Uh, there are additional, uh, there was additional support from the conference from the Florence School Fund and from the Department of uh, French and so forth. I just want to make a, a couple of short practical announcements before uh, we move forward. Uh, first of all, I, I think everyone has had the chance while he was here to recognize Guillaume. No. no. Guillaume est parti. Guillaume n'est plus là. Um, I'm sorry, uh, I asked him to stay for this. Um, uh, second, of, uh, second of all, um, we have two student helpers who are on duty today. Um, they are Jeanne Etelin and Emily Schumann, if you, would, if you would be so kind as just to stand up. So, uh, <laughs> if, you need, if, you need, if you need to communicate, with anyone, if you have additional questions and you can't ask me, please ask one of one of them. Um, Jeanne and uh, Emily will be handing around the microphones for the question and answer sessions that we'll be having. I, I'm sorry to have to ask this, and I will keep on asking it. If you if you wish to enter into the discussion, and I very much hope you will, please do talk into a microphone. We are recording everything. And m many speakers are quite confident that their voice will carry through stone walls, no doubt, into a recording system. This is not the case. And um, it, it is important that we, we want to keep a record of this, of this event, not particularly or anything that I am going to be saying, but because we think we've brought together some really amazing speakers to this event. And it will be fantastic to have a record of, of what they say, including in answer to people's questions. <coughs> um, I'm sorry that one thing that we forgot to do was to organize uh, Wi-Fi. So those of you who uh, don't have uh, cell phones, uh, 3G cell phones, um, the, your, best, your next best recourse is to use EduRoam, which NYU does subscribe to. I'm afraid if your own institution doesn't subscribe to EduRoam, uh, I'm afraid you're going to have caught us um, uh, um, in having not thought of this. Um, lastly, and kind of the most basically, there are there are toilets in this building and they are upstairs and there will be a gap between uh, the first, the opening uh, session and the round table. Um, and uh, also I've been told that to make a couple of announcements about the play. First off, uh, because, this is because the play at the Skirball Centre is part of the conference. It's free and open to the public. Or that's to say it's open to all of the public who've reserved headphones. Um, and um, 
it's open to all the public who've reserved headphones. But because anyone who's run an, an, an event which is free knows that you have a high percentage of no shows, they will start giving away the headphones when the time for the performance approaches. So if you have made a reservation either for this evening or for a Saturday afternoon, I would recommend that you turn up to claim your headphone uh, by about 30 minutes before the performance. It makes, uh, it makes things a little tight for some people, and I'm sorry, but that, that was the, uh, that's the word that I, that I have. Um, I've also been told that there's an addition to the program, which is now appearing online, but is not in the printed program, which is that there will be a, a, a discussion at the Kimmel Center on Sunday afternoon at 2.15 between Judy Miller and Francois about the play. Right? With Roland, I beg your pardon. Roland, the director of the play, will be talking with Judy, the translator of the play, and Francois at 2.15 at the Kimmel Center on, the, on Sunday afternoon. So I, as I hope this introduction has shown, the sense of sound has resonated with the inner meloman or sound theorist in many of our friends and colleagues, allowing this rhythm of roundtables, lectures, and performances that I hope will generate many more and even better conversations than those which gave rise to them. And we've we have constructed the conference in such a way as to allow generous discussion time between the presentations. It's up to you, folks, to make good use of that. And now I'm going to pass over briefly to Francois. Oh yeah, just a few words. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me too, of course, to gather scholars and artists coming from different fields and to work together on the issue of, of sound. From the very beginning, uh, Sarah and I wanted to open this conference to theory and performance, crossing the borders of knowledge and art. So we are very glad that composer, composers, performers from music and theater and scholars can share their concern about uh, these uh, sound questions. In the wake of what is called sound studies, the sound is no longer the exclusive object of musicology, <laughs> but also of history, philosophy, anthropology, politics, uh, ecology, literature, uh, art, and so on. So <laughs> since uh, the 1970s, uh, uh, when uh, Murray Schaeffer proposed this uh, famous notion of uh, soundscape, the discussions about sound milieu, sound uh, environments, and sound atmosphere uh, are now deeply involved in social issues and uh, politics. So this conference could be a kind of manifesto to affirm the importance of sonic matters, and it will probably make various sounds, unexpected soundscapes, cacophonic, perhaps. Uh, people are supposed to speak loudly, softly, to roar, to cry, to whisper. Anyway, I hope it will sound good for everyone. And now, let's sing with a star of sound, <laughs> Sarah Kay. Yes, well, obviously, I chose my title as a, as a compliment uh, to my uh, fellow speakers. I could equally, as you will see that when the talk develops, I could equally have called it Singing with the Beasts, but that wouldn't have been, <laughs> wouldn't have been half so flattering. <clears throat> the modern study of sound goes hand in hand with ecology. One of the basic ways in which we relate to our, uh, to our environment is through our ears. Living in a particular place, we're familiar with its sounds. A soundscape makes sense in the same way as a landscape might with its organizing landmarks, its beauty spots, or its eyesores, which translate in the domain of sound as its distinctive sounds, its euphonious ones, or its noise pollutants. We can exercise the right to listen responsibly to reduce and resist noise disturbance, just as we may choose to regulate what's acceptable in the visual field. But just as there are features of a landscape that escape human observation, 
In the same way, much of our sonic environment lies beyond conscious perception, given the limitations on the sound waves which the human ear can knowingly hear. Outlining the notion of soundscape in the 1970s, composer Murray Sheffer found parallels to his notion of a harmonious whole and non-anthropocentric conception of sonic environment in ancient Sanskrit writings and in the cosmology of the philosopher Pythagoras. He quotes Boethius at length on the ancient idea of the harmony of the celestial spheres. The Pythagorean Boethian account of cosmic harmony would lend itself to a conference on sound as sense, in the sense of making sense, insofar as it highlights the intelligibility of the universe. Grounded in number and proportion, the music of the celestial bodies manifests the structure of the world. It represents and expresses cosmic perfection, besides which Schaffer's project, project of acoustic design, a project to optimize the, the sonic environment, emerges as a humble avatar. Unlike the sounds that might be marshaled by acoustic design, however, the frequencies of the sounds emitted by planetary bodies are not audible to us, even if some composers, like Gustav Holst or George Crumb, for instance, have tried to capture them. Musicologists, philosophers, and others have explored this mathematical conception of world sound. My paper, though, is about ways of hearing the cosmos that are less exclusively abstract, that engage with the sense of sound in terms of how sound impacts the senses, with reference to such bodily features as breath and voice, that connect the stuff of the world uh, to the stuff that we hear. My talk really is about singing and the stars, but in the pre-modern sense of star, which includes the planets, sun and moon, in addition to what we now just call stars, but that the pre-moderns called the fixed stars. In doing so, I account for song differently from how it's typically thought of as a combination of words and music. Not that I deny the reference to words and music, which has a certain self-evidence to it, after all. But I suggest that we should also think as, of song as a conjunction of cosmology and voice, in terms of the scheme of the liberal arts which dominated conceptions of education for millennia. This approach would bring together astronomy and harmony, or astronomy and eloquence, rather than music and grammar, which would be the uh, liberal arts equivalents of music and, um, uh, music and text. So in terms of the liberal arts then, I'm thinking in terms of song as cosmology and uh, uh, astronomy and harmony, or astronomy and eloquence, or in terms of the music, of the muses, whose identities were a means to think intellectual and cultural life in the West from antiquity and until at least the Renaissance, song would be the meeting point of the muses Urania and Calliope. I'm going to be relying a lot on visual images for this talk. Um, there's not a lot of sound recordings, clearly, from the pre-modern period. Um, so, excuse, excuses. Also, um, I, I find that images are kind of quite useful shorthand for putting across unfamiliar ideas. So I'm going to start with this much discussed image from an early 13th century pontifical manuscript from Reims, which maps the cosmological soundscape and the place within it of song. The artist personifies and allegorizes the air, whose spread-eagled limbs reach out to the four cardinal winds, represented here as blowing heads against a double wheel. The contents of both wheels are understood as turning under the influence of the physical material elemental force of the air in its manifestation as the winds. I'll return later to what this might mean. The inner circle of the wheel is, uh, houses Pythagoras, Orpheus, and Arian, who between them represent the interconnected arts of song, music, and poetry. Its outer one contains the nine muses, portrayed one in each of nine medallions, which also represent the nine celestial spheres. The first three muses fall alongside Pythagoras, who's equipped with weighing scales and hammer to represent how music was written in the lang language of measure and proportion. These first three muses, Thalia, Cleo, and Calliope, are depicted as all using their voices, whether for poetry, theatre, or song. The next three are aligned with Orpheus, shown here in a pose usually associated with river gods. All are depicted with musical instruments. 
The final three muses are placed next to Arian, allegedly the founder of wild Dionysian song, who appears here according to the myth of his miraculous rescue from pirates by a dolphin. These last three muses, Eutope, Polymnia, and Urania, as well as being equipped with musical instruments, carry scrolls to mark their learning. Can you see? Sorry. There's a scroll. There's a scroll. Some of these muses fit better with the figure with whom each is juxtaposed than others. Although the muses playing musical instruments sit well beside Orteus, who also has a musical instrument, it's surprising to find those with scrolls next to the ecstatic singer Arian near, near that dolphin you'd think the scrolls would get wet. And I wonder if the outer wheel is to be understood as turning independently of the inner one, producing a kaleidoscope of ever-changing alignments. For example, a third of a turn of the outer wheel would put the muses with instruments and scrolls beside Pythagoras, line up the vocalists with Orpheus, and place the muses with instruments but no scrolls next to the singer Arian, which would be quite a satisfactory arrangement. The arts represented by all the muses would radiate through and interconnect within poetry, song, and music. Although the diagram has the familiar circular form of the cosmological wheel, its terms imply movement and development. As my last slide indicated, the names and sequence of the muses reflect much earlier writings. These etymological glosses of the muses' names derive from a work written in the 7th century called The Mythologies by an author called Forgentius, a work which sets out to discern the humane post-pagan value of the Greek myths. Forgensius devotes a chapter to Apollo and the Muses, whom he understands first as describing the physiology of voice, and then as the outline of an education in which the speaking subject masters the field of knowledge, that is to say philosophy, in the pre-modern meaning of the term. The attributes of the, of the Muses uh, define the psychological steps involved in acquiring this global understanding this dedication to the pursuit of wisdom, that is philosophy, from the first desire for knowledge, Cleo, to Urania. Uh, <coughs> okay, you must slide out here. Yeah, it should be here. Um, from the first desire for knowledge, Cleo, to uh, Urania, uh <coughs> celestial ability to judge rightly, and Calliope, the optimal, the, the optimal expression of that knowledge. Apollo, whose presence motivates this ensemble, is of course both also a star, the sun, and an emblematic singer, the god of lyric song. Closest to Apollo, Urania and Calliope are Fulgentius's top muses, the crowning sages of his pedagogy. Not coincidentally, they're also the source of inspiration for the writer himself, since his prologue, they preside, together with the personification of philosophy, over the writing of this very work. His writing is in fact precipitated by Calliope touching his throat, causing him to give voice. For Fulgentius then, the muses perfect the human capacity to combine voice with heavenly knowledge, and thus to compose philosophically. In this, Fulgentius echoes the marriage of philology and mercury written by Martianus Capella 200 years earlier, a work Fulgentius certainly knew. Like Fulgentius, Martiana stages the articulation of voice and knowledge in its highest, most celestial form. This articulation is figured in its central narrative, the successful wooing of beautiful philology, the human earthly drive towards learning, by the divine Mercury, messenger of the gods, a patron of learning and eloquence, and also, of course, a planet, or in the antique uh, terms, the terms of antique cosmology, also a star. Mercury presents his bride with seven women attendants, each representing one of the seven liberal arts, uh, <coughs> and providing a substantial account of its contents for the education of their future mistress. As the arts unfold, they're mapped onto an ascent through the heavenly spheres. For Marcionis, the culminating art is harmony or music, which brings to a conclusion the patterns of correspondence and ascent that underlie the whole work. Immediately preceding harmony, the art of astronomy also reflects on the entirety 
of his, of his text, which is informed throughout by cosmological structure and progression. So this is the this is the, uh, the, the, uh, the progression of the muses through the cosmological spheres, as Marcionis presents it uh, at a different point of the of the, the marriage of the philology and Mercury. <coughs> Starting, uh, I'm sorry, the, the 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 top for the top read bottom and for bottom read top on this um, on this chart. Um, starting with Thalia on the Earth uh, as the lowest of the muses, the highest again is Urania at the outermost pitch of the starry universe. Their sequence, that's to say the sequence of the muses here is exactly the same as it is on the image from Reims. Uh, <coughs> the nine medallions in the Reims diagram, as well as figuring the muses, therefore can be understood as representing a ninefold cosmology progressing from Earth to Moon to Mercury and Venus to the Sun and then onward to the higher planets. In other words, in addition to forming a pedagogical sequence borrowed from Fulgentius, the Reims muses also articulate a cosmic ascent which they get from Marcionis. The image att attests to a legacy of thinking in which the highest form of knowledge is celestial knowledge Urania astronomy, knowledge of the stars, while its optimal expression of voice is particularly identified with song, with harmony in some versions of the, of the ascent, with Arian in the Rance image, and with Calliope in, in others. <coughs> uh, so generally speaking, there's a accumulation of uh, of ideas of the muses uh, constructing both an education and a knowledge of the world resulting in the bringing together of cosmology and voice and expressed as song. The Reims image represents the entire cosmos as dynamized by movements of the air. Uh, here's the image again. Air is represented as a powerful male form straddling the universe. He appears both human and natural, microcosm and macrocosm. He seems at once to be the sum of all the disciplines represented in the image, their source and their driving force. Music, poetry and song are actions of the air in time and space. They form part of a cosmic design that as well as manifesting abstract harmony needs to be apprehended as a life force, air as invigorating spirit actively transformative across the whole order of nature. Although astronomy is articulated with beautiful voice, Urania with Calliope, through abstract patterns of harmony, <coughs> sorry, through abstract patterns of harmony, they are also connected by dynamic animating matter. Music, poetry, and song are material like the winds, the movements of breath in bodies, human and animal, <coughs> or the sounds of life performance. Songs are often identified as airs, whether in the Italian aria or in the French or English air. Looking beyond the Reims image, I'm going to now briefly explore some of the theoretical underpinnings of that association. Antique and medieval cosmolog cosmological schemes usually confine air to the zone between the moon and earth, that's to say beneath the lowest of the stars. <coughs> the air doesn't extend up uh, b beyond. The transparent substance through which the other spheres move is identified as the fifth element, additional to the four that make up the sublunar world. And this fifth element is also known as the quintessence or ether. But in several traditions of antique thought, this medium that gives coherence to the various manifestations of being and that interconnects with them within the compost as a whole was known by the Greek term pneuma, whose basic meaning is breath which also encompasses air and spirit. The breadth of this concept of pneuma captures intuitively obvious connections between breath, voice, life, and sound. It was developed with particular vigor by Stoic thinkers. For some, pneuma is not a substance, but a condition under which substance forms body, defined as a flow of tension, like the tension of a violin string or the drum string of a kettle drum, Every body, whether we would think of it as animate or inanimate, has its own tension, its own tuning, 
Its identity thus comp comprises both forms of soul and forms of sound that originate in forms of pneuma or breath. Uh, here's a quotation that says, uh, kind of that. Several kinds of pneuma exist in any body, each controls a different aspect of its behavior, their wave patterns being superimposed on one another, like coexisting sound waves or light waves. The cohesive pneuma was responsible for the unity of the body and for the fixed pattern of properties typical of its raw materials. The vital pneuma gave it animation, while the third rational pneuma was present only in men and other thinking beings. Different aspects of any individual creature being related to un different underlying wave patterns and the possible states of the body to alternative tones of the appropriate pneuma. For others in the Stoic tradition, this coherence in bodies has its own substance, pneuma being thought of not as the material condition or relation within the body, but as a combination of the two material elements of air and fire. Because fire is lighter than air, pneuma can penetrate the heavier elements that passively compose bodies, endowing them with activity and animation. It can also arise above the sublunary sphere, where the air alone is found, to the astral level, where its movements can be held to account on the one hand for meteorological phenomena like the winds, and on the other for theological concepts such as God and the world soul. Depending on how the pneuma in different kinds of entity is described, it can diminish or promote kinship between various kinds of living creature, from philosophers to slugs, or from deities to lichens, and between them and the inanimate universe. It does not inherently privilege the human, neither over other animals that breathe and have voices, nor over the greater cosmos. It sees being as expressive, resulting from the intimate imbrication of soul with sound. Mediated by air as pneuma, the association of Uri Urania with calliope, celestial knowledge with voice, becomes not just an intuitive relationship or one that can play be played with rhetorically. It becomes open to study. It establishes continuity between cosmology, physiology, psychology. This aspect of Stoic natural philosophy continues a view of the cosmos as active and ensouled that was already present in Aristotle and Plato. <clears throat> For example, in his treatise on the heavens, Aristotle refutes the idea of the cosmos as inert, cont contending instead that the stars and planets are active. Sorry, I don't quite know why that, or I went the wrong way. <clears throat> yeah, this is uh, Aristotle contending instead that the world was uh, uh, active uh, and that the stars and planets are active living creatures in the same way as animals and plants. In his meteorology, he represents the cosmos as subject to affections or passions in the same way as other kinds of body. So the conjunction I've been talking about between heavenly knowledge and voice is grounded in breath and soul and in, and in the universe as alive. Whatever their philosophical and scientific commitments, the cosmological treatises that proliferate in the Carolingian Renaissance of the 8th and 9th centuries and continue to be taught for centuries in schools and universities present a universe that is animated by breath and construct a history of song as singing with the stars. For example, stoic physics influenced medieval ideas of what the winds are Wind diagrams, or wind roses as they're called, regularly depict the winds as faces blowing from the various points of the compass. Sometimes four is in the Reims image, but sometimes, uh, or more commonly, 12. This is a particularly delightful one that shows the winds really as kind of spirits. <coughs> uh, <coughs> So the depiction of the winds as spiritual and animate is not the result of some figurative flourish, but results again from the, the widespread understanding that they're part of a cosmic celestial balance of, of pneuma. Um, and Obrist, from whom I've taken these diagrams, uh, sums this up by saying that, uh, talking about the way the prevailing cosmology uh, <coughs> that regarded the winds as, uh, as sublunary gave way in uh, later centuries to a stoic view of the winds, which 
places them uh, in the astral sphere um, <coughs> and relates them to Numa. As regards work of astronomy, we find that even learned ones think of the winds or other movements of the air as emanating from creatures in the sky, and thus again as forms of breath. One of the Greek astronomers whose work was most widely diffused in Latin translation was Aratos, whose work rejoices in the title Phenomena. Literally, appearances, this is a long poem in Greek hexameters describing what can be seen in the sky of the heavenly bodies and their movements. It generated numerous Latin translations in verse, verse and prose, whose titles are usually some form of the name Aratos. One of these is Cicero's, Cicero's, mark you, Cicero's Verse Aratia, of which several fine Carolingian copies were made. Is it Stoic influence that leads Cicero to describe the constellation Capricorn as breathing out the frosty cold from its strong chest? <coughs> the point seems rhetorical, part of a description of a sky teeming with animals, but I wonder if it is only so. In the case of another constellation, which is routinely associated with its exhalation, this seems quite literal. The star sign, Canis Major, is known as an emitter of heat. It's the reason why the French word for a heat wave is canicule. In, in Cicero's text, the heat is breathed out of its mouth. You can see the, whoops. You can see the, the heat there being blown out of the dog's mouth. Um, and this uh, kind of image is found uh, in other manuscripts. The winds and certain constellations are just two examples of a widespread view of the heavens as animated by breath, in much the same way as the Earth is. Astronomical treatises, in fact, look remarkably like bestiaries, the medieval books that depict different kinds of creatures. Many of the constellations identified in the sky are identical with the ones on Earth singled out for study in these bestiary texts, the lion, the dragon, the eagle, or the great fish, for example. Awareness of a potential kinship between bestiaries and works of astronomy is palpable in the high Middle Ages. Their differences are just as jarring, however, for whereas Greek astronomical works identify the creatures of the sky in terms of Greek mythology with cycles governed by Perseus, Hercules, and so on, the creatures of the bestiaries are read through the Christian allegorism of the early Greek fathers. As if in reaction to this, the High Middle Ages sees the production of texts seemingly motivated by the impulse to build on the similarities between astronomy and the zoology of the bestiary, while overcoming the incompatibilities between them. A common element enabling this rapprochement is breath, or pneuma, in its meanings of breath, air, spirit, and voice, which in turn is associated with song. <coughs> uh, here's an example of a bestiary which, um, in which the... Um, Sorry, of a, a, an astronomical treatise. This is Leo, and the red little carnations on it are the stars that make up the constellation. Um, and it's associated just with the wind in the text that accompanies it, but its pose is with its mouth open as if it was breathing forth uh, this air. So the winds and certain constellations are just two examples of a widespread view of the heavens as animated by breath in much the same way as the Earth is. Uh, <coughs> um, one, of the, one of the best of the texts that I particularly have in mind for this comparison is, a, is one known as the Physiologus of Theobaldus, which was a, a, an 11th century text, which contains 12 chapters as if in deliberate response to the tradition of the zodiac, or circle of the animals. Like the verse translation of the phenomena, Theobaldus composes in verse. He follows the bestiary tradition of his time in reading the creatures of the earth through a Christian lens. His zodiac is not about time and the problem of destiny or free will, but about fragility versus eternity. Concentrating on the motif of breath, Theobaldus repeatedly foregrounds the connections between, I'm sorry, I do keep saying this now, spirit, breath, and voice, and song, uh, his Christian zodiac begins lion, eagle, dragon, all three creatures that are also constellations. 
But the lion is the only one of the three that's also found in the Greek zodiac, and that's why I'm going to concentrate on it now. Uh, Greek astronomical texts like this one describe the lion's appearance and posture and how its body interacts with the constellations nearby. This is the, a, a translation of the phenomena by uh, Germanicus Caesar, which is also a verse translation, as you can see from the text next to the, next to the Latin. And, uh, <coughs> uh, and through, this, through this image, you can see, uh, as I suggested, the connection uh, of the lion with breath. What we also see then is a connection of the lion uh, with the bestiary, because in the bestiary image of the lion, it's also depicted as characterized by breath and voice. Sorry, but here we go. This is the Physiologus of Theobaldus entry on the lion. The lion then standing in his might above the towering mountain peaks, descends by any path he chooses to the depths of the valley. If through the familiar scent he sends as a hunter, he smooths with his tail over all the tracks his feet imprint, so the hunter cannot then track out his lair. After birth, he does not wake up until the sun circles for the third time, but his father rouses him by giving a roar. Then, so to speak, he comes alive. The lion breathes in the breath of the hunter, which it smells. It expels breath in a roar that brings its cub to life. <coughs> the divine nature of the visitation of this breath is the subject of the, of the allegory, which is found in the next and although these images that I've given, put on the slide are not from a Theobaldus bestiary, they show how this uh, particular feature of the bestiary lion is widely depicted. So Theobaldus' bestiary allegorizes earthly beasts in terms of voice and heavenly knowledge and brings it into dialogue with the zodiac. Other texts bring astronomy closer to the bestiary. Veering away from Greek tradition, they see the star signs more in tune with Judeo-Christian thought, using particularly the book of Job. One such text, which seems to be of Carolingian origin, is called Astronomy According to Christianity, uh, <coughs> and focuses exclusively on the zodiac. Uh, here is its entry on the lion. Among the stars is one called Leo, a beast with a mighty voice and courage that follows after cancer. Read rightly, it figures those in the church who thunder forth the divine word and so on. Another example is a little treatise, uh, not edited, that I came across in the Bibliothèque Nationale, which is catalogued as a little work on the stars with the bestiary. It begins as an astronomical treatise written through the lens of Job, telling how he heard the voice of God speak to him through a whirlwind. The text includes the constellations identified by Greek astronomers, but privileges the stars and star signs mentioned in the Bible. After two folios of this, the focus switches to a version of the bestiary in a transition that seems to hinge on the motif of breath. The first paragraph on folio three, which is this folio here, the last part of the uh, astronomical treatise proper, describes the heat cascading from the mouth of the dog star. Dog star. The second paragraph, beginning in Kipimos Loqui de Leone, is a bestiary chapter on the lion. The lion is described as reviving its dead cubs by breathing life uh, into them. As you can see, there's no clear separation between the two works on the page. Breath, which mediates between the parts of the universe and maintains the life forms within it, is here used to mediate the boundary between astronomy and the bestiary. From this point, I could go various directions in this talk. I could give examples of musical notation that borrow uh, the, the diagrammatic format of cosmological charts. I could talk about the genre of the alba, where songs are depicted as coming in with the, with the, with, with the, uh, with, with the movements of the heavens at the time of the, of the dawn. But instead, I've chosen to give just one example from the troubadours, since the troubadours is what I primarily work on. Uh, and I'm going to talk about uh, a couple of stanzas from a song by Rigaud de Berbazilia as they appear in a songbook which is just up the road in the Pierpont Morgan Library. As with others of his generation, uh, because Rigaud was an early troubadour, Rigaud's songs reflect a Latin education. His biographer describes him as 
really rather poor company, tongue-tied, terrible at small talk, uh, but a good poet and singer. And his small surviving clutch of songs, which were probably composed around about 1140, 1150, include many references to other texts <coughs> and vivid, if sometimes, if sometimes somewhat contrived, images. He compares himself with a lion, a bear, a stag, a phoenix, a tiger, an elephant, and various other creatures. Most have con connections both with star signs, as recognized by astronomers, and the creatures found in the best three tradition. I want, I'm going to look just at the song of the lion as it's transmitted uh, in this songbook. So memorably, <coughs> this song begins just like the lion, and, <coughs> and its first stanza spells out the resemblance. Like the lion that is so wild in its grief for its cub born, stillborn and unbreathing, and then brings it back to life and movement with its voice when it cries out to it, so love and my lady could do for me and cure me of my sorrow. <coughs> the unfolding of the stanza is carefully crafted because initially we expect it to be the lover poet who is wild with grief. But no, the lover identifies with the cub, stillborn and done breathing, that awaits its father's roar to bring it to life. It is love and the lady who are cast in the role of the grief-stricken parent. Their grief is supposed as a response to his. His future hangs on their breath, his life on their song. As the song unfolds, he continues to evoke his near-death state and cap to capture it in vocal terms. He is now singing, now wretched, as his lady reveals her rich worth to him between laughter and sobbing. At the end... He's lifeless again, his soul no longer in his body. Love and his lady could revive him with their roar, but it appears they don't. Unlike the lion that never sleeps, however, love appears to be sleeping and lets him die or stay dead because he wants to address his lady but doesn't dare to do so. <coughs> the song then is produced from the position waiting of the position of someone waiting for the inspirational breath that would allow him to sing or to roar with the fullness and conviction that he wants to. Love and his lady may be, as the incapit says, just like the lion, but the singer is not yet on their level. He is still waiting for the breath that would enable him fully to vent his passion. This makes the song an interesting example of singing about singing. As well as wanting a love that has not yet been experienced, the singer aspires to a song that has never been sung, and which, when it comes to him, will literally blow him away. The religious meaning of the lion has been transferred to the power of love, an appeal to God to save his lady, and the brief reference in these lines here to the lover's soul seem more conventional than theologically substantial. Despite the song's predominantly secular tone and its elements of humor, though, it also aspires to something ecstatic, which at once bestial and cosmic, lies outside, <coughs> outside and beyond. The, lies outside and beyond the, humor, the human and will bring a solution to the lover's woes. <coughs> uh, uh, the religious element, meanwhile, is preserved in the, in the melody. Sorry, I'm not familiar with this computer here. Sorry. Click on yeah, but I can't get the I, I can't move the um, cursor. Okay. Uh. Uh. Yeah. <laughs> we just say no. That's the other. Sorry, we missed the beginning of that. But you can, you can see that, that although the song is a secular love song, 
the melody has the kind of resonance as if it was coming from some completely different source. And I think that one of the things that that, that does is to reinforce the quality uh, in the song of, of trying to capture not the song that the singer is singing, but a song that comes from, from somewhere else that is transmitted by a beast or by the wind or by God or some other, other thing. <coughs> the Morgan Songbook, one of the medieval manuscripts to preserve this work, is profusely illustrated with images. Uh, <coughs> on the pages containing this song, are two faint Badapage drawings that unfortunately, unlike some of the others in this manuscript, were never painted and thus remain hard to see. On the verso or left hand side uh, <coughs> is a picture of the lion roaring, and on the recto or the facing the right hand side, there is a mysterious figure found on many pages of the same manuscript, usually interpreted as seraphic, as an emblem of love. Uh, uh, as, as divine. Its purpose seems to be to evoke the quality both of the singer's aspiration and of his inspiration. And I've blown up uh, these images as best I can. Uh, there's the uh, lion. Um, <coughs> yeah. Ab above the drawing of the lion, you can see a line of Latin that says the lion arouses its cub, showing awareness of the bestiary origin of this image and the winged figure on the other side of the page uh, is quite similar, it, it seems to me, to some of these winged figures of the winds, as though the, uh, the creator of the songbook was aware of the idea that the breath that circulates through the lion is also circulating and emanating from celestial forces outside, the, outside beyond the terrestrial. Just like the lion is a, is a kind of song about song, an aspiration to an inspiration, as I've called it, its sounding is also a breathing whose breath is anything but human, a pneuma that is bestial, cosmological, and divine, life-giving and spiritual, but also material. Reaching back to Fulgentius and Marciana several centuries earlier, or the Reims image a century before, its transmission in the Morgan songbook offers a double representation of song as framed by Urania and Calliope, knowledge of the heavens and its expression realized as voice. And just a couple of words to close. My paper set out to think of soundscape not in terms of mathematics and proportion, but in terms of resounding matter. Using ideas of breath and air, I've tried to piece together something of the physics and metaphysics of song this has led me to propose defining song not as the meeting point of text and music, but as one between astronomy and voice, a meeting that is enabled by the centuries-long understanding of cosmology as a particular form of psychology. Such an understanding doesn't end with the Middle Ages. Gary Tomlinson's book, Metaphysical Song, an essay on opera, begins with a chapter on late Renaissance opera that's equally founded on an idea of cosmic spirit, part material, part immaterial, interpreted in Tomlinson's case through the Neoplatonist lens of Ficino, pervading a cosmology of ascending stars in which the sun, god, star, and singer occupies a central position. The secondary role of the human ear in the sound environment is matched only by the secondariness of the individual voice. For the singing animal, human or not, song involves a voice modulated by air that can be breathed in only because it has previously been breathed out by the stars, the winds, the beasts, or the divine spirit. As it circulates among them and sustains their voices, this air undoes the exclusivity of the human, straddling the universe, just like its personification in the Pontificale of Reims.
sorry, I touched it. <laughs> okay, okay, good. Let's, yeah, yeah, please. So uh, I talked about the the what I'm what I call the, I'm calling the, the acousmatic turn. Noise and voices rustle everywhere, and we are constantly immersed in a sound environment. The ears, unlike the eyes, have no eyelids to block the entrance of sound. Passively, we receive them by vibration, even unconsciously, and by non-reflexive perception. Among these sounds, the voice receives our attention first because it seems to address us directly. It speaks to our human ears, to our sound space of recognition. This vococentrism is also an anthropocentrism. So at this moment, you listen to my voice, at least I hope you do, but uh, I would understand that sometimes you would also listen to sounds that distract and that is precisely the fear about sound shared by philosophers and more generally among speakers, the distracting noises that divert listener from the meaning. Birds chirping from outside, but here in New York City that might instead be sirens. Uh, some tweet, some twittering sound coming from your phone, and the lecturer suddenly retreats into ins insignificant noise. I refer to birds because they are a recurrent example given by philosophers since the beginning, an example to dismiss stupid discourse. Alcibiades in Plato's Symposium mistakes uh, Socrates' speech for a flute piece. He's thus stupid. Another example is Hegel's uh, dismissal of Rossini's opera, even if he liked it when he said that it sings like birds, singing or for singing, but without transmitting any message. Sounds, whether they be noise or music, remain insignificant. But the biggest danger comes from inside speech, from the voice itself, because it always produces an uncontrolled waste. Something from the meaning is led to disappear into the trash can of meaning because of the voice. Unless, and this is my point, it reveals something else inside meaning, something unintentional. What are the, these dirty elements laying beneath the code of a speech or a lecture? The voice remains a complex of sounds that is not totally under control, made of vociferation, unexpected accidents, a certain accent, you probably hear my French accents, and perhaps despite my will, uh, it sounds, my speech uh, sounds French, all too French. So many sounds occur in a voice in relation to the affects, to the memories, and also in relation to environments and spaces. I propose to focus our attention on these sound effects, not only from speeches or lecture, but also from texts because writings are deeply enmeshed in the question of sound too. Being aware of these issues probably depends on historical shifts. That is why some scholars identify a turn, like an acoustic turn or a listening turn in the 20th century, regarding the increasing importance of sonic phenomena. But I would like to give another meaning to the notion of turn by speaking of an acousmatic turn that is not a question of historical time. Of course, we know that the literary avant-garde, as well as the musical ones, of course, have raised sound to the rank of an aesthetic material. material. This turning point was also technical with the acoustic revolutions that have deeply al altered the kinds of sound we hear. The invention of the telephone, the, of the gramophone, of the tape recorder, 
all made possible by electricity and then by electronics, have radically changed the way we hear. As the sound theorist Jonathan Stern has shown, the, rep the reproduction of sound depends on mentalities, specifically on the relation between bodies and knowledge. Such a change has also been described by some scholars as a listening term. However, it would be an illusion to believe that modern times have discovered sound as such or the powers uh, of hearing. We just heard you know, Sarah talking about uh, this attention to air and sound in the Middle Age. So paying attention to auditory matters is not typically modern and one could easily quote references such as architecture from uh, classical times or literature from the Middle Age and the Renaissance that stress such a concern. Montaigne, writing about the role of listening in his life, for example, claimed that he would rather lose his sight than his hearing. <coughs> what then is the meaning of turn in the expression acous acoustic turn, listening turn, and in face of the predominance of the visual. I would suggest that a cosmetic turn expresses a theoretical point about the nature of the sound and its extension to areas where it was supposed to have no place. I speak on the one hand of an acousmatic turn in order to identify the convergence, a convergence of studies and thoughts dealing with sounds, issues, and on the other, in order to claim that there has been a shift based on new approach of voice and sound. The word acousmatic refers to the hearing of a sound with, whose, whose origin is not visible and sometimes not even identifiable. It was used by Pythagoras who taught by, with a curtain placed between himself and his disciples so that they would only concentrate in the darkness on his discourse and not to be distracted by the sight of his body and his gestures. The word has been revived in the 20th century to designate musical objects disconnected from their source, natural sounds or electronic sounds, for example. Acousmatic music is supposed to favor a listening free from of the identifications of a sound with a source. So we could, uh, of course, uh, quote uh, Pierre Schaeffer and also uh, following Pierre Schaeffer, uh, the theorist, uh, uh, the well-known uh, thinker of sound, uh, Michel Chion, who analyzed uh, off-camera voices. The interest of the word acousmatics is first of all to draw attention to the voice or the sound, the sound as such at a distance from its references. The voice is then listened to for itself although it is usually confused with speech, song, or intended meaning. So I would like to talk about the voice beneath the meaning. What does it mean to listen to a voice in itself and not to the words or not to the song? It leads to a wasteful exp expenditure of the meaning or rather to second meaning um, which lay beneath the explicit meaning. It's to hear the sonic investments of thought that come from a region other than that of reason and consciousness. Listening to voices, regardless to, of their explicit source, lends access to other tunes, landscapes, and meanings, even in the most abstract writings. Thought makes noise. It cries. It carries the sounds that surround it. It is thus necessary to take out our earplugs and to access the acousmatic dimension of text. Whereas our assumption is that thinking creates concepts, signs, and images, its sonic dimension is rarely recognized. The, reco the recording of dissemination of thinkers' seminars, however, have recently provoked an interest in philosophical speeches. Access to thinkers' voices, like those of Arendt, uh, Russell, uh, Adorno, Beauvoir, Kristeva, and so on, thanks to their recorded seminars, conferences, and interviews, allow new studies of and new approaches to their thought. 
This is also a way to recall that philosophy, transmission, at its very beginning, was oral, and that it was practiced in the form of dialogues, performances, bodily attitude as meditation or wanderings. Pierre Hadot and uh, Michel Foucault have recalled that philosophy in ancient Greece was not defined by doctrines and theories, but was a complex of exercise and discourse. And discourse. We have forgotten this usage of philosophy and we, we usually misunderstand the ancient philosophers by projecting upon them the modern conceptions of philosophy. Reading their works with earplugs is a frustrating way to access philosophy in the academy. But, well, I would say it's a kind of voluntary deafness. By focusing only on the philosophers who dismiss the role of the voice, the teaching of philosophy is condemned to miss the sonic dimensions of their thoughts. Metaphysics has de facto always promoted a voluntary deafness. According to them, the art of the voice remains on the side of rhetoric, sophistics, sophistic poetics, but not philosophy. Pythagoras himself, although he used an acousmatic pedagogy, discredited the sound of his voice by placing a curtain between himself and his audience. He claimed that the most important remains behind what is visible and also audible. Even his voice passing through the curtain should be listened to as a neutral um, minimum medium carrying this meaning of speech. The, this, this kind of staging symbolizes the metaphysical gesture par excellence. It dev devalues the perception of the senses and, in and it invents doubles. The voice in itself is nothing. It's the vehicle that indicates something absent, coming from behind the veil, a world behind the world, as Nietzsche says. It is significant that even contemporary philosophers belonging more or less to this tradition, even those who deconstructed it, reproduced that this dismissal of the voice. They constantly duplicate it, they double it, as if it were not or in, it, uh, of itself, in itself sufficiently significant. The voice always expresses something else. Another voice, the one of the soul, of God, of the essence, of the meaning. The voice is supposed to ex press, as if something else is always inside or behind it that resonates according to its interiority. You know, this famous myth of interiority. Agamben distinguished the voice with capital V and the ordinary voice in order to return to the original moment of the human agreement with language. Jean-Luc Nancy, also influenced by Heidegger, try to understand the voice as a, I quote, resonance of the meaning. And those who comment on opera's voices, like, for example, Badiou or Zizek on Wagner, interpret the libretto and the politics in these works much more than they do the music and the voices themselves. So a real acousmatics, a materialist acousmatics that would pay attention to the voice in itself requires a materialist approach of sound, of physiology of sound, of physiology of sound. By getting rid, of, getting rid of the doubles, the voice of the soul, the voice of being, of the origin, of God the Father, the voice of the mother resonating in the, in, in the fetus, one can finally open one's ear to sound itself. The turning point is based on this philosophical shift, escaping from anthropocentrism and accepting the materiality of voice as a complex of sound. And one should rather listen to other philosophers from classical times, not Plato, but also Lucretius. Instead of considering the voice as an expression of the soul, he gave an atomistic description of the sounds coming and to and going out of the body. According to him, 
the voice is composed of vocal atoms that move out through the throat and that enter the other's ears. Unlike visual atoms, they move by twisting so that then they can seep through tiny passages. That is how a voice can, for example, traverse a curtain, whereas visual simulacre, simulacre cannot. But when the physical obstacle is too strong to be penetrated, then the sound atoms go back and rebound between mountains, for example. That, that is what we call echoes. In face of acousmatics, naive people, because they can't see the source of the voice, believe that chimeras, ghosts, or gods, are addressing them. Lucretius made fun of the common illusion of people imagining like, like the metaphysicians, hidden speaking beings. But a materialist description, on the other hand, could easily explain the phenomenon. At the same time, Lucretius challenged the unity and the specificity of each human voice. Breaking with metaphysics and anthropocentrism, he explained that voices, human and non-human alike, can spread out into multiple ears and be heard in different ways. And in order to be well received and thus well understood by this, his audience, he advises Caius Memmius, the senator he, he addresses, to take care of the balanced quantity of vocal atoms exiting his mouth. <laughs> Too many atoms results in poor listening, and I should be aware myself of such an advice. Even if this mechanistic atomism may make us laugh, it encourages to listen to the voice for itself in its multiple realities and diffusion. Indeed, one should avoid fetishizing the concept of the unique and coherent voice. But we could, of course, say that uh, the concept is always, in a way, a, a fetish, but that's another question. Uh, it is thus necessary to describe the various strata of sounds that occur in thought, both, both spoken and written, as a result of breathing, rhythms, and surrounding noises. Instead of underlying, underlining the style of an individual voice, listening to the vocal utterances leads to being, to being aware of various relationships between a speaker and his or her ideas. In fact, a thinker does not necessarily incarnate his thought. He is not a unitary or coherent subject without gasp, gaps or syncopation between him and his, his discourse. Admittedly, division or multiplicity is difficult to concede when it concerns a thinker, whereas when accepts that a novelist embodies several egos as a person, author, or narrator, or character. Yet life and ideas do not automatically match and they involve complex relationships. Listening to voices precisely makes it possible to approach these discrepancies. Beauvoir's voice, for instance, is multiple. Even within the same time, when she wrote her philosophical essay, The Second Sex, she was simultaneously writing love letters to Nelson Algren, professing opposed ideas about women. We could quote many philosophers who use such paradoxical voices, not in order to lie, but as they experience different theories and multiple personalities. Kierkegaard, for example, was perhaps one of the best examples of the polyphonic polyphilosopher not only on, in his adoption of contradictory, contradictory thesis, but also by composing his philosophical voices in, opposi in opposition to the life he was leading at the same time. The voice thus does not express the soul, nor even the spirit. It is invested by multiple conditioning, as the body, codes, affects, accents, and collateral noises. Sometimes a thinker struggles with himself in order to repress 
some unwilling voices. The accents, the native tongue, for example, can emerge like a disturbing sound inside the supposed neutral voice of philosophy. Derrida, embarrassed by his Algerian accents, wrote in the monolinguism of the other that he constantly repressed it and that writing was a way for him to invent an intonation. I quote Derrida, an accent signals, signals a struggle with language in general. It says more than simple accentuation. Its symptomology invades writing, end of quote. And as a polyglot, originally from Bulgaria, Julia Kristeva, says that in her writings, whether in French or in English, she inhabits sounds like new bodies, like new gender, without controlling what sometimes whistles from the early babble of her childhood. So we could think of thought uh, as soundtracks. Thus, a voice may be considered as a complex of soundtracks, thanks to this displacement of the speaking subject who is no longer the center of one's speech, a thought can be listened to as a soundscape. Several of its compo components should be highlighted. Vocal characteristics, breathing, rhythm, speed, volume, and intensity. Vocal accidents, hoarseness, wavering, cries, and whispers. And, all, and also all the noises in the backgrounds. The cicades that stridulate when Socrates interacts with his disciples, the gurgling sound of water and the twittering of birds during Rousseau's solitary reveries, the cracking of wicks that disturbs Schopenhauer when he meditates. By the way, Schopenhauer considered hearing as the primary sense through which the auditory nerve reaches down into the deepest part of the brain. He asserted that great minds such as Kant, Goethe, and Jean-Paul regulated their lives according to their sound milieu, whereas stupid minds were insensitive to noise. One's relation to sound is a criterion of intelligence, the quality of which is judged by the way one regulates, or mixes, one might say, the sonic realities that make, it, that make up the acoustic world. Thinking is knowing how to compose the best sound milieu for one's mind, how to select it from it the most favorable sounds. Referring to this sonorous presence that determines the activity of thinking, one should also listen to the melody in Nietzsche's head as he writes, thus spoke Zarathustra, hoping for, a, I quote, a rebirth of the art of listening, eine Wiedergeburt in der Kunst zu hören. We know that listening to Carmen allowed him to heal and to become, according to him, a much better philosopher. I could, <laughs> in Nietzsche. And let's also reference the Dean in the cafe where Sartre composed being a nothingness, through which probably he could hear the voice of the German occupiers. All these seemingly anecdotal noises playing an inspiring role in the writing, as much as these authors allude to them explicitly or not. Usually, educated readers tend to block their ears when they read supposedly abstract texts. But if one pays attention to the process of a thought, taking these sound elements into account, new dimensions of meaning are opened up. The sound milieu, far from being circumstantial or in simple environment, plays an active part in the making of thought. I manage my atoms. <laughs> Once it is admitted that a single thinker uses several voices, one can receive a thought as 
composed from a complex of sounds. Some philosophers, such as Montaigne, Kierkegaard, Deleuze, and Kristeva, embraced this sonic multiplicity. And they developed their thoughts as a mix, sound mixing with shouts, whispers, and silences. Deleuze's seminars reveal various typical tunes in his speeches, as if he were an actor. The most interesting point is perhaps his intonation when uh, he advanced concepts. Deleuze managed dramatic effects which culminate in the shouting out of fetish words. Confirming, I quote uh, Deleuze, the exclamatory nature of the principle, the identity between the principle and the shout, the shout of reason for excel par excellence. And he commented in this way, Spinoza's cry in the ethics, which is really uh, unexpected. Mixing shouts and silence was typical of the soundtrack of Lacan's seminar too. And Foucault himself confessed that he grasped, he grasped uh, um, uh, Lacan's thoughts by listening to it as if it were a piece of music. Lacan often, often uh, interrupted his lecture and sometimes for as long as 30 seconds, even though the conventions of oral delivery usually prohibit such suspensions. The lecturer would then start up again with the violent pronouncing of some rhetorical shifter or connector that rearticulates its discourse. Let's listen to Lacan speaking of death. La mort. If you don't understand French, that's even better. You Et du domaine de la foi. You can concentrate just on the, the voice. Vous avez bien raison de croire que vous allez mourir, bien sûr. Ça vous soutient. Si vous n'y croyez pas, Est-ce que vous pourriez supporter la vie que vous avez si on n'était pas solidement appuyé sur cette certitude que ça finira <laughs> According to Claude Jeglet, who wrote a silent portraits of Jacques Lacan, these repeated silences are not only theatrical effects, effects, rather they participate in the thoughts process, allowing moments of resonance and reflection for the ideas and affects that have been thrown at the public. They form part of a sonorous milieu made up of inarticulate, inarticulate sounds since Lacan used to roar and bellow and produce other noisy exhalation of breath during his workshop, often tapped on the table to beat out the rhythm uh, of an argument. So what, it, what could be a, an acoustic thinking? This investment of sounds in the making of thought suggests that one might connect philosophical studies and sound studies, especially when paying attention to the evolution of the audio techniques. And acousmatics must, must be aware of the connection between the voice and its acoustic diffusion. You know, that's the distracting noise, you know? and that's good, it's, it's, it's part of uh, the speech. Uh, and uh, it's not merely uh, just a question of technique, but because the way thinkers use audio devices can modify the way they speak and write. Let me suggest this proposition with an example. Sartre, speaking and writing at various moments of the 20th century. Corresponding to the auditory disposition his life found itself in. 
First of all, one must say that when he was a prisoner in Germany during the Second World War, he experienced for the first time a theater stage. Prisoner were, prisoners were allowed for Christmas to make performances. Performances, And he described his, this experience as a series of discoveries, those of the direct address addressed to the, an audience and of a frontal uh, acoustic that promotes direct discourse and so on. And he began to write plays as a new genre for staging his philosophy. Then came the liberation and Sartre was asked to make radio programs, experiencing the acousmatic addresses to, to invisible listeners. He adopted a, a voice and a tone typical of the radio at this period, and he discovered mm, the possibility of being broadcast widely and immediately listened to, whereas previously he had known only the abstract communication with the, of written books. This new medium led him to choose a kind of speech that was much more addressed, received in sync with his, with, uh, his delivery. For Sartre, the medium of the radio was directly linked to a new public and political commitment, reinforcing the concern to, I quote, write for an audience, which he formulated in his literary manifesto, What is Literature? in 1948. An acousmatic reading of this text in the post-war years reveals a forcing of speech, an orality close to that used by the philosopher on the radio. His sentences and his ideas, for example, in this manifesto, are clear-cut and simplified. The use of the microphone and of the amplified voice thus modifies the relation of the ego to its voice, and as a result, modulates its way of addressing others. Pursuing this interlocutory approach, Sartre multiplied speech even. Even, uh, ev uh, events. even using another audio device later, of course, the megaphone to address workers at factory gates. C'est à vous de dire. Si l'action de Gessmar est bonne ou non, je veux témoigner dans la rue parce que je suis un intellectuel et que je pense que la liaison du peuple et des intellectuels qui existait au 19e siècle, pas toujours, mais qui a donné de très bons résultats, devrait être retrouvée aujourd'hui. Il y a 50 ans que le peuple et les intellectuels sont séparés, il faut maintenant qu'ils ne fassent plus qu'un. Non pas pour que les intellectuels donnent des conseils au peuple, mais au contraire, pour que ces masses prennent une forme neuve. Et c'est pourquoi je vous dis, nous nous retrouverons certainement. However, by the end of the 1950s, a more intimate device, the tape recorder, became common as it emerged in private practice as a household item. In the late 1950s, Beckett and Sartre even transformed it into a theater character. In Krabs' last tape and in Les Séquestrés d'Altona. The intimate recordings allowed for new sound experiments to the point that Sartre used it very abundantly, abundantly to make voice tests. He recorded himself, and there are hundreds of hours of audio archives still unreleased. He sang pieces from classical repertoires, such as Gounod's or Foray's melody, playing humorously with alternative phrasing in the style of. These recordings testify to the fact that he made a point of listening to the soundscapes he could make playing with his voice or with the sounds he produced. Thus, the link between the practice of recording and the way of writing should be explored much further. And uh, for this conference, I brought this gift for you, this recording that um, has never been released, 
and it's a kind of première, that's Sartre singing a foray's melody, Lydia. So this uh, self-listening, because that's a self-listening practice not to be released, of course, you know, uh, have been not sufficiently studied by critics, although they form part of an important Specular, specular experience. If looking at oneself in the mirror has been widely studied in and commented on, listening to one's voice is relatively unexplored territory, except by some isolated, isolated philosophers like Merleau-Ponty in his last phenomenological writings. The tape recorder uh, has facilitated uh, facilitate this sound reflection of the speaker who hears his own voice without entirely recognizing it, because he's used to hearing himself while speaking, and suddenly this exteriority gives him the impression that his voice comes from another ego. Bart also used the tape recorder quite a lot, uh, notably to record himself practicing music, piano, and songs too. Rather than listening to the pieces played, played by famous performers, he preferred to hear his own imperfect recordings, for he loved recognizing his musical body playing and singing as if it were both his and that of another. Bart describes these sound recordings as a masturbatory activity, playing with one's voice as another self. He enjoyed his own intimate rhythms, even if he did not respect the composer's score at all. <laughs> These sound experiences nourished his theoretical reflection, and I would say that many of Barthes' concepts and themes, such as, just for example, uh, for instance, idiorhythmics, touch, rubato, what he, what he wrote about rubato, awkwardness, uh, amateurism, uh, all these notions are deeply indebted to these sonic practices. The alternative also between the shock, the coup, and the lullaby in other texts. The claim also for intimacy are fancies that stem from these experiences, the, uh, thanks to the, the, the tape recorder. And one should not forget that also politics is involved in the voice. Bart commented on the master voice in various texts, and he challenged the masculine voice of power that strikes and colonizes the ears of others. In his seminar, he held a kind of neutral voice over and against that master voice. This example should lead uh, to us to adopting a new way of listening and reading, especially the listening of abstract writings that are supposed to be mute. So last, uh, last part, um, I would like to sp speak of, of uh, a second stage listening. You could imagine or hear, trying to, to practice a second stage listening. This alternative way of listening allows, would allow access to underlying meanings. In order to perceive the sonic dimension of the thinking voice, one needs to adopt a floating manner of listening, similar to that of psychoanalysts who listen to the process of the unconscious through speech. In French, as uh, Sarah uh, reminded us, uh, psy uh, psychoanalysts often say, je vous entends, with the double meaning of hearing and understanding. Gaining access to the making of thought implies recognizing the components that contribute to this process, affects, drives, and the whole physiology that manifests itself in the thoughtful voice. Reason never operates independently of these elements. In order to hear the sensory underpinning of this construction, whose tensions involve both in the elabor elaboration of ideas and the thinker's psyche, it can be fruitful to adopt this second stage listening that suspends the primary explicit meaning and holds it, holds it at a distance. The meaning is still present, 
but its suspension allows one to reach the substrata, the substrata of signification. Such a second listening renders audible the speaker's psychic investments in ideas, the relationship between ideals and experiences like dreams, desires, or fears. The, this whole complex is detectable, for example, in an excessive voice, uh, an astonishing volume, or certain ways of uttering, articulating, or shouting certain concepts. Such a listening might, be, might seem devoted to orality, but let me state that acousmatics is precisely a way of accessing sounds in, in writings too. Listening to, to writing, that is reading with one's, one's ears, is a kind of auscultation. It's like putting a stethoscope on the body of text and detecting, detecting their sounds. An acousmatic reading of text aims to hear these sonic substrates, whether their vibrations are at the origin of the, or at the end of the words and the sentences. The fact that such attention is not strictly speaking a perception and that it doesn't refer to a physical acoustic, acoustics is not a pertinent objection because music, voices, and sound themselves can also be received in an acousmatic way without their physical source being accessible. Just as the imagination allows the images to be presented in one's mind from intentional consciousness, what we call inner hearing allows us to sing in our head, as well as to access sounds through the mediation of scores, texts, memories, that is, by more or less codified association. An acousmatic re listening experience can be shared and possibly even objectified, if one can identify the sound components of the text concern. They vary in nature from the different voice of, speak of a speaker, the musical works accompanying here, he, her, uh, the, the sound surrounding him, the, the rhythm and the breath that traverses, that traverses one's body. Through the language, of course, that have been used, each one with its own accents, so listening to such sounds, I think, opens an immense field of inquiry. So, in conclusion, texts, even the most abstract, are full of sounds, layering of voices and noises. An acousmatic inquiry, far from proposing a simple analogy between philosophy and music, seeks all kinds of sounds, even the most disharmonious, by which I mean those sounds that do not match with the intentional sense. Texts or theories may be listened to as soundtracks. The aim of an acousmatic reading is to hear clusters of voices, the multiple voices, that is, that whisper or cry through the master utterance, the dead voices, the spectral voices carrying some enduring accents or haunted by repressed desire. Yes, thinking makes noise, and the art of listening, as Nietzsche say, says, consists in noticing the overloaded concepts, or on the contrary, the rustling ideas, the stammering of a thought, or its hoarseness. In a philosophical text, one can hear the straight rhythm of the rationality, as well as the delirium of the ritornillo. There is no clean voice, but streams of sounds that draw the sonograms of thought. The anthropocentric privilege granted to articulated language has caused us to forget that meaning is also lodged in sounds of all kinds, and if philosophers have constantly feared being passively seduced by insignificant melodies, it's time, thanks to an acousmatic turn, to pay active attention to the brouhaha of that. Thank you for your listening.
So it's time for some uh, questions. I'll start with what you just said at the end, because I don't understand it. I don't understand how we leave the Anthropocene to get to the brouhaha of thoughts, because as far as I know, the thoughts come from the Anthropocene. Are you suggesting we are penetrated by thoughts coming from somewhere else? Of course, you know, that's because sounds, you know, it's, that sounds from everywhere. So, uh, why, why, why would you say that uh, thought is uh, uh, anthropocentric, you know? You, 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 we, do you mean that uh, we couldn't speak of uh, thoughts coming from uh, uh, non human animals? I believe in this kind of uh, thoughts, of course, you know. <laughs> yeah, to your cats, yeah. <laughs> um, your lecture uh, is uh, the, um, the term. Yeah. Um, it's interesting to, 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 to see that, uh, and you've mentioned there is a history of, uh, of the acousmatic mm -hmm. um, interest. Uh, I think it's very interesting to, to, to remember that uh, at the beginning of the century, the neogrammarians were so much interested in phonation uh -huh. that they had forgotten that language was a medium used to communicate. Mm -hmm. 20 years ago, a conference into, uh, in, entitled Sound and Sense, we would have been speaking of Jakobson. Uh, so <coughs> it, it's, I think it's... The turn is, is circle, actually. But I have one question for you. Um, you've uh, reminded us many times that acousmatics uh, is the situation of the listener uh, who, has no, who doesn't see the cause of yeah. the sound. Yeah. But at some point about Sartre, uh, you've uh, mentioned the, the fact that there were invisible listeners. Yeah. So do you mean that acousmatics is as also to do with this situation? Yeah. yeah. You, you see what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Sh uh, I'm not sure. Yeah. You mean that there is for a thinker well, I something think which is, uh, and, 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 uh, I mean, invisible? The source is invisible for what? Sartre, what, 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 Sartre yeah. is talking to... Yeah. People he doesn't see, and yeah. you call them invisible listeners. Yes, yeah. So I'm questioning this um, appellation. Yeah. Is there such thing as an invisible listener? You mean that there is no uh, invisible listeners? The, the, well, uh, not a yeah, you, you, said, you said that when we listen to a radio, for the speaker, we are invisible listeners. Uh, that's what I experienced, I have to say, yes, but, uh, <laughs> I, but probably you have something in mind, you know, <laughs> you should Well, say I'm not so sure that, there, that, that is the, you know, I'm not so sure that, that acousmatics can be transferred from the absence okay. of the cause okay, I understand. to the invisibility of the person who is speaking to you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, I, I, I understand. Um, I mean, that's for Sartre, the, the important shift was to speak to somebody without seeing them, but in sync, you know, in the same time, you know. Yes, but he is the speaker. Yes, he's the speaker, but, you know, that's different from, because you could say that, for example, uh, uh, writing is an, uh, and to invisible uh, readers, it also a question uh, of acousmatics. Okay. May we, could we pass on from this dialogue? Because I think there are other people who yeah, want to ah, talk. Sorry. sorry. Well, first, thank you so much for these wonderful two papers. And I'm wondering, actually, 
how the connection between these two uh, papers could be made. Uh, because one of the things that I found fascinating is, in effect, the way in which what you were exploring as cosmological soundscapes almost came back in the rest, that noise that is not the logos, if you want, of language, the rest, the... Mm -hmm. And I wonder whether your cosmologists would actually say, no, the soundscape is actually where the logos might re reside. So. Uh, I'm just sort of throwing this out because I think there's a very interesting way in which those two things could be. Yes, I mean I don't I don't use the term acousmatic, but the what I what I was trying to say was that n n uh, nothing was ever lodged definitively in any in any place. It's constantly m moving and in suspension and in motion. Um, but both of them are forms of movement. Right? Suspension is attention and uh, and and, mo and movement and that. Uh, and the the the, the 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 what what the what the song that I gave as an example is doing is describing somebody who is only thinks that he is singing because he hears something else that we don't hear and that comes from somewhere else that we don't know where it is, mm. and um, so that the term acousmatic would be just as mm. appropriate for mine, but uh, the. I obviously, my, the period that I'm dealing with doesn't have the electronic ga gadgetry that, um, that Francois is able to talk about. I, mean, I don't know if you want to. Yeah. Uh, I think that's uh, what I really um, appreciate in, in, in uh, Sarah's uh, conception of, uh, of uh, voice, air, is the fact, yes, that, that uh, uh, her way to reread. Aristotle, for example, and the question of air, you know, uh, is a way to go beyond the, the, the metaphysical uh, distinction between the human and non-human, and also to get access to this, uh, well, that's a cosmology, but that could be perhaps also a, a physiology of air. I, I don't know if uh, <laughs> I go too far, but uh, so I think that also in Sarah's uh, uh, conception of uh, song and air and breath, there is this kind of uh, shift, you know, uh, speaking of voice not as, uh, you know, c coming from uh, the soul and our expression, uh, but really as, uh, you know, uh, some um, uh, f physical uh, matter, you know. But I, I think what the, the period that you're writing about enables you to, to talk about is the metaphor of the soundtrack, which I think is brilliant to think of the soundtrack, mm -hmm. the soundtrack of the text. I think that's a really wonderful yeah. mm -hmm. idea, um, and I I wouldn't you know I don't think it's I don't know how applicable it is outside the period in which there was such a thing as a soundtrack. Mm -hmm. Sounds, yes, soundtrack, no. <laughs> you know, it's, it makes a difference, I think, the, the forms in which sounds can be registered, how they can be thought of, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. uh, hi, can I ask a question? Okay. Um, I have a question for uh, you, Francois. And, um, you know, because you're talking about acoustics and rhythm, um, it makes me think of uh, some of the more traditional ways that this has been worked on. Um, for example, in the tradition of, uh, of structuralism, um, writers like uh, Henri Méchonique or someone like Jean Moreau writing about, um, you know, poets of 19th century who look at uh, accent, rhythm, or stylistics as a, a kind of structure uh, in a text, for example, that uh, is particular and gives particularity to an author, for example. Um, but then you also cited this text of uh, Derrida, for example, where he says that you know when he he confesses almost that when he reads he hears uh, René Char, right? This is a completely alienating experience <laughs> yeah. that uh, he cannot take seriously at all. This famous writer, uh, and so that the accent becomes instead something of a uh, something improper, you know, uh, something embarrassing that you you can't take seriously. Yeah. Um, so I wonder then uh, what it means, maybe you could be a bit more specific then about what it means to read acoustically, um, or you cited also Nancy saying it's a resonance between a, a meaning and, a, and an acoustic. Yeah. Um, 
because I think even then to say like it could be a kind of a between between a text and an accent already seems to kind of betray I think what you're trying to say. Thank you, thank you very much for uh, this, uh, this this question. Uh, of course, in this uh, in Derrida's text, there's this, <coughs> this crazy uh, confession about uh, you know uh, not taking, uh, uh, don't, not giving credit to uh, someone who would have such a, an, an accent from the south, you know, and that uh, he couldn't, uh, yeah. He, he, as if you know someone. Giving a talk, uh, you know, with this uh, accent would wouldn't be a philosopher just because of his or her or his accent, you know. That's, that's, that's a very French position. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I don't know. I don't know here if perhaps someone really with the, an accent from Alabama. I don't know. Uh, I'm not sure that it could. Well, anyway, because sometimes I can hear someone saying, "Oh well, <laughs> where does he come from?" Well, I speak, but anyway. Just, I want to, to answer. I would like to answer, yeah. I think that's what is very interesting in Derrida's uh, confession is the way he said that writing for, for him, and it's not only for him, you know. You can find the same uh, confession with, in uh, Bourdieu, in Bourdieu's uh, last book, uh, Essai d'auto-analyse, saying that he constantly repressed his uh, accent from the Southwest, you know. And uh, so that was, to, they, they had to, to, well, to take uh, account of the, this uh, so-called neutral accent, but we know that it's not neutral at all. You know, uh, at the Ecole Normale Supérieure, they had to, you know, to repress this, their regional accent, as if there was non-regional accent. Yeah. And uh, so, what is very interesting in the Derrida's book is that the way he said the writing he, that was not only a repression of any accent, that was to, to invent another accent. That was not only to incarnate, you know, the, the, the neutral, the so-called neutral uh, accent, but to, to invent a new intonation. So that means that we can perhaps also hear in the style, in, the, in uh, his writing, this way, you know, to be, not to, not to be too loud, for example, he said that I'm afraid of being sometimes too, too, too loud, you know, and uh, so I, can, I, can, I think that it's, you, you can uh, see it, read it uh, in the text it itself, this uh, effort. Thank you. Um, I have a question uh, that I, I think, thank you for, for complicating. I think we talk a lot about voice and text and le grain de la voix and yeah. for putting in the syncopation and the background noises. I was curious about Sartre. Is he playing the piano himself in those recordings? You said Bart did, yeah. which then it complicates because it's not simply listening to himself, but it's the, the, the combination of playing and singing and yeah. experimentation. Yeah, sure, sure. Uh, in the, this uh, excerpt, you know, Sartre was also playing uh, piano and singing. Uh, and uh, yeah, of course, he, he, play, he played a, uh, a lot, you know. Uh, There's a kind of a mental process that goes, it's more complex than just listening to myself sing. Yes, because, because when you listen to this, uh, there, is, there, there are plenty of recordings, you know. There are plenty of recordings. Uh, perhaps. Uh, yeah, hundreds of hours, yeah. And it's, well, deep with, the, with the, um, uh, his uh, daughter, they, they played, you know, they, it's, it's a kind of joke and, uh, you know, uh, trying s some voice tests, you know. So, but that was always, uh, that was also a way to create uh, soundscapes between them. Uh, I would like to go back to, to the question about the, the, your two voices, your two, the, the articulation of, of Sarah's point and, and Francois. Uh, I had a feeling, so there is, and that's maybe also, it was part of, of Judy's first question, uh, where does 
there, there is a kind of uh, beyond the subject, beyond the person. <laughs> um, there is a kind of rumor of the world, but I think it's my feeling was that what uh, Sarah showed us was something that beyond the so something harmonious, a, a kind of you know those beautiful uh, muses uh, nine, twelve, all that is well numbered. While uh, François was more, uh, his last word was the brouhaha, <laughs> uh, and so there were kind of. I would say two m philosophical models, one almost Platonician, I would say, and the other one, since you quoted Lucretius, very uh, atomistic. Right. A question. <laughs> a question. Yeah. Right. I agree with you. I think it's true that um, uh, one of the people that I was quoting is, is, is Neoplatonist, Neo Marcionus, but I actually... Um, I have made a point in the work I do to to avoid Plato and the Neoplatonists, and um, I mean the, the the philosophical traditions I was quoting were Stoic and uh, Aristotelian. Hmm. Yeah. yeah. So I too had a just it's more of a comment actually. Well, it's a request for a comment. I was looking for resonances as well. The one resonance that I did hear immediately after I had heard your talk, Sarah, was. I picked up on the word wave. I think you pronounced it once. Mm -hmm. And then you know, there's the breath, which seems to me very direct, and you get the voice. When we, talk, when we think about sounds and song, mm -hmm. we think about the waves. We know this from physics. Yes. Um, and this is also a comment and a question that comes out of my forgetting, having read Aristotle. The Ar Aristotle probably has something like that in the about this in the physics. And with you, Francois, yes, the, the reference to Lucretius and the atoms, the way he describes the atoms, at first we think this is the direct uh, exiting of the atoms and the direct reception of the atoms in the ear mm. of the other, and yet, as yeah. you pointed out, they corkscrew. It's kind of a screwy theory, as a matter of fact, this screwy theory about how they corkscrew their way through any bear. So w what did remind us both of you, what, each of you, what, what did the ancients know about, about waves, what we know about waves today, and this penetra penetrability, not the penetrability, it's the penetrating force of, of waves? I think they knew more about vibration than they mm -hmm. knew about waves. Mm -hmm. I mean, they knew that you could tune a string according to how thick the string was and how long it was. Um, I think the notion of, I, I mean, I may be completely wrong, there may be somebody in the room who knows better than me, but I don't think the notion of the sound wave or the light wave was known in antiquity. And yet Lucretius was talking about a screw, maybe a screw, a screwy motion is not the same. It's not, it's not the same. Yeah, 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 no. yeah. Twisting, you know, sort of twisting, twisting yeah, yeah, yeah. Going everywhere, and so that's why it's difficult to control these vocal atoms, uh, whereas mm. visual atoms, you can, you know, you can block, <laughs> you can block the this uh, uh, simulacra, simulacres, but uh, vocal atoms, no. That's why you know it's so dangerous because <laughs> it could go everywhere. You can hear what what should be, what should be what should remain mute, you know, what should remain mute, and so that's why it's always dangerous. Yeah. Um, I have a question um, about what you said, Professor Nivelman, in about freeing sound from an identification with a source. Um, and I was struck by how in the Lucretius passage you mentioned there's a kind of separate embodiment of sound in, its, in their own atoms. And I was wondering, is there a sort of overwhelming tendency that we try to materialize sound, um, that in either in a source or as its own kind of embodiment, and how might we sort of rethink that tendency to make sound material? Yeah. Well, first of all, I think that we have to say that sound is uh, material, you know? 
And, uh, uh, well, I would say that's precisely because of this uncontrolled way for sounds going everywhere, you know. Well, uh, I think that's uh, these ancient thinkers felt, you know, the necessity of embody the sound to control it. Frank? I have two so small questions for Francois. One is a curiosity for me. Uh, who did your uh, uh, sonar environment during your speech, uh, <laughs> during the, your lecture? Um, <laughs> I, it was quite curious for me. In a way, you escaped from the PowerPoint lecture where we see <laughs> what, what he said. The second question is bit maybe more serious. <laughs> I don't know. Um, in a way, with, your, with the materialism perspective, yeah. you of course, you escape from meaning, from religiosity, from all this doubling. Right. But I think that you, you took two ways, because in the first way, it's the materiality of yeah. sound, that you, are, you have interest for this. Yeah. But the other way is the rhetoric, because I think that when you give us to hear Lacan, we hear Lacan, we hear also an histrion, we hear an actor, we hear someone able or trying to convince us of this event, which is not exactly the same thing as to hear the materiality mm -hmm. of the sound. So y y there is two approach uh, to me. Uh, yeah, yeah, this, yeah, this yeah, aspect. yeah, yeah, you're right. Uh, first of all, you know, I did myself the, the, uh, <laughs> the audio environments. <laughs> it was very amateur. <laughs> and uh, uh, regarding these two ways, yeah, of course, Lacan, uh, listening to Lacan's uh, seminar, you know, well, uh, that was more. Ref you know, regarding the 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 the, the, the silence, you know, the and there was a question about structure. Uh, yes, silence and sounds are, you know, uh, involved in the question of uh, the meaning and the language as a structure. Yeah, yeah. So that was just an example to perhaps to hear the. The, the way uh, thinkers um, works, work on mixing, mixing uh, sound, mixing silence and, uh, and words. Uh, but uh, of course, you know, what is, for me, what is more interesting is to listen to some unexpected uh, sounds and that would reveal perhaps other meanings. Uh, perhaps psychic investments in the thought uh, or other things. But uh, yes, um, that's uh, the claim for, uh, my claim for uh, uh, second stage uh, listening. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, okay. thank you. Um, I'm sort of wanting to go into two directions, a small comment and then a question that connects the two again. Uh, one is the, the issue of accent, which is why I was at that moment sort of responding. Uh, there is the issue of the accent from within language, so the southern language, the, uh, the southern accent. And I lost my southern accent very quickly when I moved north because I knew I would be sounding stupid if I spoke. Ah, so that's the same language. in the United States? So. No, Germany. Uh, ah, okay. The second thing, uh, <laughs> however, is that there is the accent from without. And Edward Said has written quite a bit about what it means to carry an accent of a subaltern. And I think there's a big difference between Derrida uh, being aware of Algerian accent. What do you mean? Uh, if you have an accent that is not French French, if you, are an, if you speak as a non-native speaker and you okay. carry a non-native accent, it's actually a, a very different thing. Okay. And that kind sure. of links to where I actually want to go with my question, and it's a question of violence in language. Because, I mean, in a sense, I was, again, rethinking the image of Sarah and the winds and the air, and there's something very violent also about the sheer noiseness that gets visually represented of the wind. But also the violence, I, I was very fascinated by Sartre's rendering of Lydia, because in one sense, it was actually wonderful, because he created a completely different reading of the song, but it was a violent reading that actually erased Fourier in a very interesting way. 
So you give credit <laughs> to this uh, interpretation. Yeah. yeah. That's fascinating. Yeah. Yes, I, I mean, I agree. I mean, they, the, the, the depictions of, 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 of beasts that you find really throughout a huge, huge swathes of time in, in the heavens, on maps in strange places, and in books of animals or that are intended for teaching about animals, um, they're, all the, they're all the same animals or creatures that are found, or at least there are, great, there are high levels of overlap between the creatures that are found on the earth that you know in far away countries that you don't know and in the sky. So that they're all kind of connected up by this fauna, which is savage. Um, and the lion that's roaring, although it's, yes, it's waking up its cub, um, it's not intended, I think, to be a nice noise. And, uh, you know, the, 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 and the, the, the myths that the star signs are associated with are no picnic, you know, to be amongst. Um, and so I, I, I think you're right, and I... I I'm glad that Dini asked the question that he did, because if I gave the impression that I was talking about hominy, I need to dial that one down and dial up uh, the noisiness a bit. Uh. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, you, you could say it, well, I said, but that's Kristeva, uh, who is in the situation of you know, speaking English or French, even if it's not her, her uh, native uh, tongue say that, well, this is, you know, a, ca a constant displacement of the of the the, the subject. You know, the, because the, it's it, she, she she wrote that in the, her book entitled "Étranger à nous-mêmes." So that's we are feeling stranger to oneself by speaking in another language, and with this uh, suddenly. Uh, 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 childish uh, accent, you know, coming back, em emerging, and uh, the way of, uh, you know, hearing the the voice of the of the childhood. So, so that's yes, that's a constantly feeling of uh, being being stranger everywhere. Uh, thank you both for these wonderful papers. I wanted to ask a question that was motivated largely by Francois's talk, but that has some resonance with the comment that Sarah made at the end about wanting to dial back the harmony. I want to perhaps <laughs> suggest that maybe you, Francois also wants to dial back the harmony perversely enough. Um, Freud, as you know, famously did not like music because he felt that he couldn't understand what it was supposed to mean. And he, he needed to translate it into words in order to appreciate aesthetic phenomenon. And it seems to me that in, in a certain sense, the, you know, it, when Shakespeare talks about tongues in trees and sermons in brooks, uh, there's that temptation always to turn sound into thought. And so when you speak about thought as sound, <laughs> I wonder if there's a way we could think about sound without thought um, so that we can decouple sound from thought. And instead of, for instance, as you were suggesting at the end, thinking about the the acousmatic as the psychic resonance that gives us new levels of yeah. meaning, perhaps offer a way of thinking about what resists that translation into the psychic and into the meaningful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's such a question. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, <clears throat> What, what does it mean to get rid of any psychic investment in sound or getting rid of thought in sound? What, what's, what does remain then? Just hearing, right? What's that? Just hearing. Hearing, yeah. Mm -hmm. Hearing. And that's enough. No comment, you know, just, just hearing. Something like, like unthought. The unthought, yeah. Emotion? Emotion, affects, yeah. Yeah, but I think that's, even if it's not a rational 
thought. Thought is always involved in even the perception. You know? oh, well, I completely disagree with that, I'm sorry to say. I mean, it's not, that's not at all what I'm trying to talk about. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I, uh, I, I think, um, as you know, I've, I've written about uh, what Aristotle's discussion of voice, the connecting it not to the rational cell, but to the animal cell, and, uh, and that thus completely pushing it at a distance from, uh, from mental activity. Um, and, uh, you, you know, there, there can be texts even with words that, that really are not particularly um, related to thought, and there's plenty of voiced, voiced material that doesn't have words in it. Um, I mean, I've been playing with students these crazy uh, rondo where they're you know they're poly of these texts which are these motets which are polyphonic with only one vocal line and all the rest of the people are going la 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 or boom 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 or something and it you know it's kind of it's kind of, <laughs> it's, it's kind of crazy um, or, or they're doing it in a way that you couldn't possibly understand what they were saying anyway or it's in several different languages at once so you know I, I actually don't think that a lot of the even you know humanly produced um, vocal sound, and not, not, to, not to mention all of the vocal sound that's produced by other creatures with voices. I don't think it's uh, connected necessarily to thoughts at all. Mm -hmm. Well, it depends what we, you, yes. you, call, you, yeah. you call thoughts, you know. Uh, just by the way, let me say that uh, Freud, you know, loved uh, the notes de Figaro, Mozart's uh, opera. <laughs> And also uh, um, um, a French uh, singer, but uh, well, very popular singer from, from the, the beginning of the 20th century. So there is two exceptions in this uh, hatred of music uh, by Freud. I think we should just take one more question and then kind of reorganize the, re re reorganize the, um, the, the laptop for the next set of speakers. Uh. Can I ask it? Uh, I was surprised that the word hasn't been used, which is the word the noise, uh, and, uh, which is a very important concept for the theory of communication. Uh, so would you have something to say about the, the exclusion of noise? Are you talking about me? Both because do. Francois gave a pretty good example of noise, I thought. Example, this yes, but did you? So, would you make it? What difference would you make between noise and sound? Well, I, I mean, I guess I think, uh, I, I think that I would try to undo the difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Uh. I think. I mean. I think it is. Uh, I think it's quite a strange thing to do, to think about song as not made of words and music. And as soon as you do that, then you're uncoupling. As soon as you uncouple song from words and music, you're actually uncoupling it from fairly familiar signifying processes. And it does become, uh, I mean, it, 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 and the relationship between sound and noise, it seems to me at that point, becomes less clear cut. I would say that the n noise is uh, the sound you you don't like. <laughs> I noise you. Oh, thank you, everyone, for your comments, and I, I hope that well, they will keep coming. Um, and we will stop there, and we will take ten minutes for the prepare for the next uh, for the round table, which is going to be chaired by Evan.